Welcome to topic 5.7, Meat Production Methods. Thanks to the work of paleontologists, we have evidence that tells us that meat, due to its high protein content, has constituted a substantial portion of the diets of even the earliest humans. Tens of thousands of years ago, our ancestors were primarily hunter-gatherers and worked in organized hunting parties for animals such as bison and deer. But it was the domestication of animals beginning approximately 12,000 years ago that allowed for the production of meat and the breeding of animals specifically for that purpose. Animals that we now rely upon as primary sources of meat were domesticated in conjunction with the development of early human civilizations. Sheep were domesticated as early as 10,000 years ago. The origins of cattle domestication date back nearly 7,000 years. And domestic pigs, which are the descendants of wild boars, date back nearly 4,500 years. Just as agricultural practices for crop plants evolved dramatically in the latter half of the 20th century, the same is true of meat production methods. These methods bring with them their own advantages and disadvantages and can have impacts that range from the economic to the environmental. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA, more than 150 million animals are slaughtered annually for their red meat, as well as billions of poultry animals. Nearly all of those animals were raised in concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. CAFOs are also known as feedlots, or high-density animal farming. In this type of farming, animals are confined and allowed very little room for movement during most or all of their life. The USDA classifies CAFOs based on the quantity of animals contained within them. A thousand cattle, 2,500 pigs, or 125,000 chickens. Meat production in the U.S. and around the world has become increasingly dominated by these types of animal farms. For example, in the 1960s, it took about a million farms to house the country's 57 million pigs. But only 40 years later, there were only 80,000 farms that housed the same number of pigs. High-density animal feeding operations like these have both benefits and drawbacks. The most direct advantage of a CAFO is that substantially less land is used to raise the animals, leaving that land available for other uses, or perhaps none at all as a nature preserve. They also eliminate the damage caused by overgrazing, which we'll take a look at a little bit later. Having the animals contained and confined in a relatively smaller space makes it far more time efficient when it comes to feeding them. And perhaps the most significant advantage, and arguably the reason why CAFOs exist, is the cheaper cost of production and therefore lower cost to the consumer. In a screenshot from the website of a local grocery store, we can see that the cost of chicken breasts raised in a high-density animal farm is $2.99 per pound. At the same grocery store, you can find chicken breasts raised in organic lower-density farm for over two and a half times the price. As you can probably imagine, having huge numbers of animals confined in this manner presents some impossible-to-ignore disadvantages. There is evidence that the regular use of antibiotics given to confined animals may be contributing to an increase in bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Another disadvantage? What do you do with all their poo? When a farm has thousands or tens of thousands of animals, their manure must be disposed of properly so as to avoid issues like surface water and groundwater contamination. Another disadvantage, and the most difficult to quantify, relates to animal well-being. There are obvious ethical questions and concerns that could be raised around keeping animals in habitats like these. Let's explore two of the previously mentioned disadvantages of CAFOs, animal waste and disease outbreaks in antibiotic use. 
An average CAFO produces over 2,000 tons of manure every year. A manure lagoon is a human-made basin that is filled with animal waste. The manure lagoons are created when animal waste is washed out from underneath animal pens or delivered by tractor. Once in the lagoon, the manure settles and begins to undergo chemical processes as the waste breaks down. A couple byproducts of this decomposition include the greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane, which contribute to global climate change. Additionally, manure lagoons are known to contain dozens of types of disease-causing pathogens that are dangerous to human health. Sometimes, during heavy rainstorms, runoff from these lagoons can contaminate nearby surface water. The second problem of serious concern relates to antibiotic use. When any group of organisms has a high population density, such as that found in a CAFO, the potential for disease outbreaks and transmission increases. In order to proactively maintain the health of the animals and prevent disease outbreaks, antibiotics are regularly included in the feed for the animals. The high usage of antibiotics drives the evolution of bacteria to become increasingly resistant to them. As an alternative to high-density animal farming, free-range meat is becoming increasingly popular. The term free-range is meant to describe an animal that has the ability to wander freely outdoors for at least part of the day. The use of fencing and shelters is quite common in free-range operations, but animals still have the opportunity and the area to move around extensively. Some of the benefits of free-range farming include the decreased use of antibiotics since animals are not kept in close quarters, little or no need to feed them since they live off of the natural productivity of the land, and their waste is dispersed over their range area and naturally processed by decomposers in the soil. In the United States, the United States Department of Agriculture regulation on free-range farms currently only applies to poultry and only denote the fact that the animal was allowed outside access. The term is primarily used for marketing purposes, and regulations do not specify the quality or size of their outside range, nor the amount of time that the animal was allowed access to it. Large quantities of roaming, grazing animals have the potential to cause environmental damage. Overgrazing occurs when plants are subjected to grazing over a long period of time or aren't given sufficient opportunity to regrow. Land that has been overgrazed exposes the soil since plants have been chewed down to the surface. Exposed soil is more easily eroded by wind and water and is compounded by the fact that overgrazed plants are more likely to die resulting in a loss of their root systems that help to further bind the soil together. Reduction in soil depth, organic matter, and nutrient content hinders the land's future agricultural productivity and may take decades or even centuries to recover. Overgrazing results in increased trampling and compaction of soil by livestock. This decreases the permeability of the soil hinders plant growth, and further exposes soil to erosion since precipitation is less likely to infiltrate the surface of the ground, contributing to runoff instead. Lands that have suffered this kind of damage and ecological change is said to have undergone desertification. In other words, it's being turned into a desert-like ecosystem. With the exception of influences due to cultural, ethical, and religious considerations, meat consumption and affluence are directly related to one another. As societies become more affluent, they tend to consume more meat. In already developed affluent nations, meat consumption has seen very little change in recent years. As a matter of fact, 
consumption of beef in many places see, has seen a slight decrease, and pork has as well, but poultry consumption is on the rise. In many developing nations, or in places with increasing affluence, meat consumption is on the rise. Although poultry has seen the largest increase in these areas, beef, and especially pork, is becoming increasingly popular. It is the market's demand for meat that drives its production. And since the demand for meat is increasing, the environmental impacts of meat production are as well, and nearly all of them are negative. As illustrated by this graph, the area of land required for the production of meat is greater than for the production of most other land-based food products. And don't overlook the fact that Although not raised for their meat, dairy cattle are raised for their milk and the production of dairy products like cheese. In this graph, five of the top six water demanding food products are animal or animal based. And beef alone, per unit of food energy, requires nearly three times as much water as the next three categories combined. Meat production is responsible for up to 51% of the world's anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, with ruminants, that's cattle, being the single largest contributor. Some types of meat require significantly more energy inputs to raise and process them for consumption when compared to the caloric output that is gained. In this diagram, the concept of an energy subsidy is illustrated. Let's use coastal fishing as a reference point to explore this idea. Coastal fishing requires one calorie of energy input for every food calorie made available. The energy input could be in the form of things like human labor, fossil fuels needed to power the boat, and fossil fuels needed to transport the fish that were caught to the consumer. Feedlot beef, such as that produced by a CAFO, requires nearly 12 calories of energy input for every single food calorie produced. On the other hand, corn, grown on a small scale, requires two-tenths of a calorie of energy input for every one calorie of food yielded. In addition to the animal waste and desertification consequences observed earlier, deforestation, is a growing problem that is directly connected to the meat production industry. In nearly every region of the world, from the Amazon to Africa, Australia to Sumatra, large and small-scale agriculture and the meat production industry are significant contributing factors to deforestation since forested land needs to be cleared to make space for those industries. Livestock, such as cattle and pigs, account for nearly two-thirds of all mammal biomass on Earth. Meat production is one of the leading causes of particulate matter and pollution in the atmosphere, as well as the formation of acid-producing emissions, such as sulfur dioxide. Emissions such as these have been associated with respiratory conditions like bronchitis and asthma, as well as the increase in the prevalence of pneumonia from bacterial infections. Air pollution will be explored in much greater detail in a later unit, all to itself, as is this final impact, climate change. That brings this look into meat production methods to a close. Thank you for watching, and as always, take care.